morning and welcome to God at Work. It's really good to be here with you again. And today's subtitle is Rescuing Lives. Last week, we talked about the importance of obedience and how that can mean the difference between life and death at times and how God desires for us not only to hear his leading and guiding, but be obedient to it. And today, that's exactly what I'm looking at. I'm looking at two different examples in one trip to Morocco. And it was really kind of exciting. They were both very different circumstances, very different ways, but both involved the importance of being obedient as God chose to be rescuing a life. So we're going to start out with one of my very favorite songs right now. It's all pretty much like my theme song for this program, and it's called I Will Look to Jesus, Jerry. Whichever way the world goes, whichever way the wind blows, I will look to Jesus and follow where He leads. Though storms may rage around me and wars come past surround me, I will look to Jesus and follow. Sees beyond the present to a future resplandescent, a day with no more sorrows when all tears are wiped away. Though torments have assailed me, his love has never failed me. So I will follow Jesus till my dying day. Whichever way the world goes, whichever way the wind blows, I will look to Jesus and follow where He leads. Though storms may rage around me, and wars come past surround me, I will look to Jesus and follow Now I can trust no other, no sister and no brother, my father or my mother, unless they follow him, much less some politician, a preacher or musician, no actor or physician. Unless they follow Him Whichever way the world goes Whichever way the wind blows Oh, I will look to Jesus And follow where He leads Though storms may rage around me And wars come past surround me I will look to Jesus and follow where He leads. Yes, I will look to Jesus and follow where He leads. I will look to Jesus and follow where he leads. Some of the places that I have gone in these many years of ministry have taken me to some very unusual places and circumstances, but it's all been so important to follow him each step of the way. And I learned some really important lessons in this trip as well, like I talked about last week. But can we put that first picture up, Jerry, of the city of Shashawan? This is the city of Chef Shawan. It's up in the hills in the mountain area of Morocco. And it's a beautiful little town. And I mean, it's a little town, but it's got some quite interesting little quirks about it that I'm going to tell you about. But part of the city 
is completely walking only. You can only drive up to a certain point and then you enter in the, uh, uh, what's called the old town actually. And they call it in some cases, the blue pearl because everything is painted white or shade, different shades of blue that they add in to the white paint. They add little chalk coloring in to make it different shades of blue. The entire inner town is like that. That's where the entire city is. It's all, and that's all walking or you cannot drive into the inner, inner city. You get, get up to a certain point and that's it. Well, I had been doing some meetings over in Gibraltar and Southern Spain and the pastor there said, he said, I really would, one would like to know if you'd like to make a trip over to Morocco. It could be very interesting for us. And I, you know, I said, I prayed about it. I, thought, I would love to do that. But um, I don't speak Arabic, <laughs> but I did at that time. I spoke French a lot better than I do now, and I needed that in Morocco. But we took the ferry from southern Spain over to the Spain that's on the northern coast of Africa, crossed the border into Morocco, and caught what they had, these taxis that you could take to where you wanted to go that were very reasonable. And we drove and drove up into the mountainside of Shefshaun. And when we got to the end of where the cars could go, there was like a circle and the taxi driver kept going around and round and round and round. What is he doing? You know? And I realized they had all these guys there that were wanting you to hire them as your tour guide. And so I talked with the pastor from Gibraltar and I said, you know, that might be wise because there's a lot of things in, in Morocco that you cannot do that are not allowed. And I thought it might be, be a little wiser if we had a local tour guide so we looked more like normal tourists and so the taxi stopped and we talked with this guy and we ended up hiring him and he, he did speak some english fairly well and definitely spoke french and we got by between a little bit of spanish and a little bit of english and a little bit of french we made it and um but then then as we're carrying around all these guys are coming up to the window wanting to know if we'd like to buy some chocolate now, I was thinking as a mom, oh, chocolate, that would be a great gift for me to take home for my kids, Moroccan chocolate. And I was looking at it, and, and the pastor from Gibraltar looks at me and says, you do know what that is, don't you? And I looked at him and I said, chocolate. He said, but you know what Moroccan chocolate is. I, said, I thought it was chocolate. He said, Moroccan chocolate is known all over the world as one of the top selling areas the drug hashish. I had no idea. So I almost brought Moroccan chocolate home as a gift for my kids. I would have been in big trouble at the border. But then he let us off at the edge of the city and we entered in to the Blue Pearl, as they called it, the Blue City. And you had to walk from there. You could not do anything. So we found a place that we were going to be able to leave our luggage for the day. We only had a little overnight bag type things with us, you know. And so we found what we could do with it. And the guide was showing us all through the little back streets in the old town. And it was really beautiful. But there was this one central plaza, the next picture, Jerry, the central plaza. That's all walking. You could not drive up into the plaza. Like you see, there's a, a police car there. And those are the only type of vehicles that could go in there. You had to have a special permit or be a police or emergency vehicle. Other than that, you could not even drive in that in the old town. And there's only certain paths that were even big enough to get into the plaza. But there was restaurants all around the plaza. So we spent a lot of time there. We would go from restaurant to restaurant. Now, in Morocco, you are not allowed to evangelize the Moroccans. That is completely forbidden. That, like, I could sit there and talk with my friend from Gibraltar. We could talk, and anybody around could be listening. I wasn't, I wasn't talking or evangelizing a Moroccan, just talking to my friend. And if something was said that caught their attention, if they asked me a question, I was allowed to answer it. Legally, I could answer their question. But I could not elaborate on it. So I could give them the short answer. And that was as far as I could go. But usually that led to another question and another question. And we went on in that manner. But it was kind of interesting because in each restaurant, we've, there's plazas and the um, patios right out 
on the plaza. So we got to sit out there, enjoy the weather, enjoy the view, and talk with each other about the Lord. And now talk about how important Jesus is to us and, and why. And, and the pastor from Gibraltar shared a bit of his testimony with me and vice versa. And all of a sudden people started asking questions and talked a little to answer their question. And a couple of times I went to elaborate and our guide looked at us and gave this little, uh -uh, don't do that. <laughs> and so that was fine. And then we were at one restaurant right in front of the next picture this is a central mosque, and there's a restaurant right across in front of it that you can see. And we were sitting on that patio, and we were talking, but we were actually talking to somebody and a little elaborating on the answer to the question. And then the tour guide came into the conversation, and he completely changed the subject. I mean, completely Change the subject, completely different direction, asking where we would like to go next. We wanted to go up to the hotel up on the mountaintop. It was a beautiful view, you know, expensive hotel, but beautiful view. And I wondered, what is he doing? And then I got caught on and answered his question and said, that would be beautiful. We could do that later on. And then a few minutes later, he led us back into the conversation. And so I looked at him and I, I turned around and there were, three policemen walking away. So if we carried on, and if he had not stopped us, we would have been arrested for preaching the gospel. And uh, I won't go into detail, but I heard some pretty gory stories about what happened if you got arrested for preaching the gospel there in Morocco. We didn't want that. So we're very thankful. That tour guide, although at that point he was not a Christian, he didn't know the Lord, but he figured it was his job to be obedient and protect us. So he rescued us from the hands of those police officers and literally saved our lives. If we just stuck, got stuck in Moroccan jail, who knows what would have happened. So it was really wonderful. But that mosque that was also in that other picture, that mosque was the central mosque in Chef Shawan, the biggest central mosque. And several times, I think it was five times a day, if I remember correctly, but I could be wrong. Um, the bells would ring and everybody, all the Moroccans in the area in hearing distance would all of a sudden like start walking. It was almost like they would turn and almost like robots start walking toward the mosque and get down on their little mats that they carried with them and onto their knees and start bowing, doing their prayers. It was, it was, I'd never seen anything like it. I wish people were as obedient to come into our churches when the church bells went off. But they walked com completely, turned as soon as that bell started ringing and started walking toward the mosque to do their daily prayers. I couldn't believe it. I mean, it was such an instant obedience. They didn't even stop to think about it. They didn't stop to finish what they were doing. They could have been in the middle of a conversation. The waiter at the restaurant we were at walked off right past us to go to do his prayers at the mosque. I guess they had arrangements waited into workplaces as to who would go at which bell ringing because they did do it several times a day. But it was quite interesting watching it happen. But then we came time for, actually it came time for lunch. And we went into this really nice Moroccan restaurant. You can see in the next picture. They were very elaborate. That was the pastor from Gibraltar that was there. And I'm on the, on the side. But it was a really beautiful little restaurant. You know, it's like you're almost sitting on the floor. You're sitting on a cushion and your legs are stretched, were stretched out in front of you. And I was watching at a table a few places over. And there was this... Moroccan gentleman eating a, something I wasn't quite sure what it was. And um, that was fine. We had our lunch. I didn't look at the delicacy that he was eating at that point. But then we went for another restaurant at dinner time. And in that restaurant, all of a sudden, 
two plates were brought up and set in front of us. Can you put the next picture up, Jerry? This is quite, <laughs> this plate was brought and sat right in front of me and another one in front of my friend, Michael. They were actually, we only had the half head. So this is a whole head, but we were given the half heads. And I looked around and there was the man who'd been eating it in the other restaurant. He had noticed that we were observing and he was obvious that we were tourists. And so he wanted to serve us their delicacy. We had a little chat with him when he was leaving the restaurant before. So we did get a little bit of a conversation with him. But anyway, he gifted us with these two platters. And I mean, they ate every part of that meat off that skull. They ate the eyeballs. They ate all of the cheek meat. They ate the lips. They ate the tongue. They ate the ears. They ate the brains inside, everything. And I thought, ay, ay, ay. I'm looking at this thing. And I, I had a custom that when I first started traveling, I tried to instill in my ministry life because I realized that in a lot of cultures, if you reject what they offer you, they reject what you're offering them. And I was trying to offer them Jesus. And I most certainly did not want them rejecting my Jesus because I rejected their gift offering of a goat's head. So I'm sitting there and watching how others are eating it. And they're, they're just digging right in and gouging a chunk off the cheek, you know, and gouging the chin up. And, you know, so I took my fingers in, got a little bit and I accidentally, on purpose, uh, dropped a bunch of it on the floor, but uh, I got a little bit in my mouth, but not a whole lot. And then I had to go to the restroom. Well, when I was off in the restroom, the waiter came by and was clearing the table. And he I guess he felt I was finished and took my goat's head off the table. Thank God. I came back and I noticed it was gone. And I was looking at my friend from Gibraltar and he'd taken theirs. They'd taken his as well. And he said, oh, yeah, they took it. I, I told them you were probably finished. I said, thank you. And then the waiter came over and he said, oh, were you not done? And I said, oh, I'm fine. Thank you. And he said, could I bring you another one since we took yours away? And I said, oh, no, I'm full. Thank you very much. And, and let it go. I most certainly was not wanting another goat's head brought on. But then it was coming time to find a place to stay for the night. And as I was showing you that earlier picture, the whole area was all white and different shades of blue. But in that very, very first picture of the blue town, Jerry, could you put it back up? There we go. On um, Right up that little pathway there was where our, the hotel we found was. We were right up that hotel and it was all blue. The door was blue and everything else, but we were just about two doors up that hallway. And then the next picture coming up is the reception of the hotel when we got inside. Again, the blue and white motifs all there, ready to go. We got registered. It was not a real fancy place. It's actually, your bathroom was not in your hotel room. You had to go out into the hallway to a shared bathroom. So that was fine. In the middle of the night, I had to get up and go to the bathroom. So I headed out and went Went into the bathroom, and when I came out, I heard quite a ruckus. We were up on the first floor up. I heard quite a ruckus on the main floor, and I looked down over the balcony, and there was a guy in there that was just slapping this woman. So I went down the stairs and in, into the lounge area. This is the lounge. The next picture, this is the lounge area. It was quite dark and dim, even daytime and nighttime. This is daytime, I believe, but it was really dreary in there but I went in there and I I walked up to the girl I said oh hi how are you doing it's good to see you in French and um, she looked at me and then she realized I was trying to help her and I said are you okay here is this guy bothering you maybe he we should um, ask him to leave and she looked at me and I said could you please just leave I'd like to talk with my friend here and he look gave me a really dirty look and he left and she was from France from a place in France called Toulouse and she was there with another friend and this guy had picked the two of them up taken their passports and was putting them out on 
prostituting. And she was really scared. She wasn't going to go. The friend was already out and she was refusing to go, which is why he was hitting her. So she had run into the, She wasn't a man in this hotel, but she ran in to get away from him and he followed her. That's when he started slapping her around. So we talked for quite a bit and she ended up that night receiving the Lord. So we got her over to her hotel and she got her stuff out of there and came back to where we were and they put her in the room right next to mine. We took took care of her room for her because they took everything. She, they, she didn't have a passport. She didn't have her wallet, nothing. And the next day I went with her as she knew where she was going to be able to find them because they were supposed to meet these guys at this particular bank at a certain time to give give him their money if they were going to get their passports back. Well, we went down there and I was with her and the guy saw me coming up and he did not look happy. And so I, I said, look, you need to give her her passport right now or we are reporting you to the police. We did anyways, but he didn't know we were going to do that. And anyway, so he looked and he said, no, 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 she needs to give me my money. I said, what money is your money? You took her passport and you, I started talking quite loud. You took her passport and you took her purse and her wallet and everything she had. You took it. What money is she supposed to give you? And he looks at me and he looks at her. And I said, I know you wanted her to be out there earning money for you, but she wasn't out there, nor will she be. Now give the passport now or I'm going to get the police. And there was a policeman just out front of the, of the bank where we were at. So he handed over the passport and I said, and the purse. He said, I don't have it here. I said, well, we'll wait right here and we'll stand right beside the police officer if you'd like, but you go get that purse right now. So he went to get the purse. And in the meantime, we talked with the police officer and explained what was going on. So when the guy came back, the police officer was watching, didn't come over, but he was watching. And he watched that she got her purse back and she checked, he police said, check it carefully, make sure everything is there. So she did, and her money was there. Wasn't much, but her money was there, as well as her other ID and her credit cards and everything else. And um, then we started heading off to go right back into the old town. And the guy started to leave, and the police officer, two of them, surrounded him. But it was a pretty freaky situation but there again god intervened and rescued that girl that girl a lot of them apparently they get stuck in with these guys and they get stuck there not just for a day or two that they're in there they get stuck there for years months who knows how long until they can escape so god intervened twice he rescued the pastor from gibraltar and myself from the police that were watching to see what we were doing and then he rescued that girl from the hands of this pimp. So God is in the business of rescuing souls when we're willing to step out and be obedient and take his leading and his guiding and his cues. I tell you, I was a little bit shocked with our guide, wondering what he, he was doing, changing subject right in the middle of a very important discussion. But then I realized he was saving our life. He was rescuing us. So it's really wonderful watching what God does. And um, I'm going to ask Jerry to, to close with one more song. And I know that um, I surrender all. And I know that when we surrender all to him, it's amazing what he does. Jerry, I surrender all. to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live I surrender all I surrender Blessed Savior, I surrender all. 
Surrender all. It is such an important lesson to learn as we walk through each and every day following Jesus. Such an important lesson to learn. I surrender all. I had to surrender when our guide went off on a completely different tangent. I had to know God was doing something and be willing to surrender and change my idea as to what I should be doing. And listen to what God was doing. Same with that woman. I had to surrender. I wanted to go back up to bed, to be honest. I did not want to be down there in the middle of a fight. Especially since my pastor friend, he was sound asleep in another end of the hotel. So I wasn't really too thrilled. But I had to be willing to surrender, knowing that a lot of times our obedience, our surrendering, can mean the difference between life and death, which is what it meant for me and the pastor from Gibraltar. It could have meant. And with her, it meant the difference between a life of freedom and slavery to that pimp. We've got to be willing to surrender all in obedience to him. I surrender all. And I, I do hope these, these last couple of weeks dealing with this subject, I've spoken to some of you. And I hope that it's helped you make some changes. If so, send me a little note and let me know. I would love to hear your stories. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all that you did on this trip to Morocco. Lord, it was a very interesting and different trip. But it was also a learning experience. Learning how critical it is to be willing to switch and be obedient to you right at the drop of a dime, right at the interjection of our tour guide. Be willing to say, okay, Lord, I don't get it, but you know what you're doing. So, Father, I ask that you will speak clearly, not only to me each day, but to each person that listens and desires more of you, Lord. In your precious name, amen. Praise God. I do hope that this program has been of an inspiration for you and an encouragement to know that as you take steps of obedience, even though it might seem strange, God has a reason. So God bless you. Jerry's going to put the information up on how you can send an offering to the ministry if you'd like. And in the meantime, we'll see you next week. God bless you. <laughs>